can all be seated in God's presence. Thank you. It's been an interesting week, hasn't it? Well, you're going to have to do better than that. Remember I told you about demand? You know, some of you, most of you have had children, I guess. When your kids are hungry, what do they do? They ask, don't they? They just sit down with their tongue hanging out. They say, Mom or Dad, I'm hungry. What do you got to eat? What's for dinner? What's for lunch? They put a demand. And if they didn't put a demand on it, the mother's probably still going to feed them anyway. But it gets to an age where if you don't put a demand on God, you don't get. And how do we put a demand on God? Well, we ask. No, no. We ask in faith. Not doubting, but believing. That those things which we say shall come to pass, for we believe them in our heart and speak them out of our mouth. Isn't that right? Is that right? Have you been doing that? Have you been doing that? Not all the times you don't. Sometimes you do believe what other people tell you. You've got to be careful of that too. So we're going to have a bit of fun today. I want to do a little resurgence. Uh, last week we had some interesting things to say. If you were here to see hear them, that's good. But today I want to talk a little bit about that email blast that went out. And by the way, you know, Donna does a real good job and her family do a good job keeping an eye on the email blasts and so forth. But if, you're, if your email address is not in our system, you won't get them. We're not asking for anything on those emails. We're just giving you information, uh, specifically about what may be coming up or what's not coming up or some special events, things like that. That's important information. And uh, if you're following IGO Church on one of our websites or one of our streaming outlets, then that's very good. But remember, give us, give us your email address. Amen. Amen. Give us your email address. Is that loud enough for everybody? You hear me okay? All right, good. Uh, we sent out an email blast last week, Thursday. I got one, I don't know about yesterday, but it certainly went out this week. And in that email blast, I put this, do you know that you can determine exactly what life stage you are in as a Christian? Do you know that you can know what life stage you're in as a Christian? I didn't come to preach to you today as much as I came to inform you and teach you a little bit. Because the only, the only legacy any preacher has is what's made of what he's taught. The people who learn something from what they've taught and pass it on to other people, that's their legacy. Not buildings, no, you know, books and tapes are nice, but people sort of put them in a box somewhere and forget about them. But when lives are changed and hearts are transformed, then those hearts and lives as they are transformed help transform other people. And your presence makes that possible. There's men and women in the audience today, and I'm sure there's some watching, quite a few watching over on the internet. But your life, people watch what you do. They don't always listen to what you say, but they watch what you do. And I think it's important for you to realize that when you go out somewhere, where you talk to people, make sure that what they see is pleasing to God. If you've got some things that are not so nice to see, don't do them in front of people until you've dealt with them yourself in private. It's like a physician, heal thyself. And many doctors around that don't look after themselves. And uh, even though they preach to other people what to do, they don't do it themselves. Remember, I went on a fishing trip one time in, in Texas somewhere. and We had a, cardi a, a cardiologist. He was a heart surgeon, actually, a valve surgeon, or whatever he does. I know. And uh, he comes onto the boat with his two bags. And I said, what's in the bags, doc? He said, a Big Macs. I said, how many? He said, I had two Big Macs, and uh, there was one of those milkshake things. I said, come on, Doc. He says, I know, but do as I say, not as I do, you know. So I, I looked at it, I said, okay, fine. I don't think I'm going to go to him for advice. You know, they may know what to do, but if you don't do it, what's the point? Same thing with Christianity. You know, Christianity is not a religious observance. It's a life-changing event that begins on the day that you're born again. Now, we're going to talk about these six stages of life, actually seasons. And you know Ecclesiastes, I've taught you a lot of things, but over the years Ecclesiastes says there's a time and a season on the earth under heaven whereby, excuse me, time and a season under all men. And so when those seasons come, there's a season for good and a season for, for hardship. There's a season for life, a season for death. So if we understand how the scriptures operate in seasons, the same as we do with uh, our climate, then those climatic changes, like right now a spit nippy, so you dress accordingly. But we're supposed to be dressed with the armor of God, which is found in Ephesians. And 
to begin with all things, it starts here in the mind, you know, transforming our minds, allowing our minds to think the way God thinks. And we go to the book, we go to the word for our direction. If you go to other people who don't know Jesus Christ as their savior, or you go to religious folks, you may get an answer, but it won't help you because there's no life in it. Hear what I'm saying? If you want life to be transferred into your heart, then you have to feed your heart life. You have to feed yourself light, L-I-G-H-T. When there's light comes into your life, then darkness will flee. A little bit of light takes care of a whole lot of darkness. And so what we're going to be talking about with these six stages or six event, life events, if you like, will help you classify not just where you are, but perhaps where you've been and give you some heads up on where that may take you. Now, there's a lot of things that can be said about when God does things in the life of a believer. But I can tell you from experience, there's a lot of things that he doesn't do yet because you're not ready and you can't handle them. First of all, he's looking for two main things. First, a good heart. Now, nobody can buy, can buy themselves a new heart or, or a good heart, a faithful heart. These things are learned. And some of the greatest people that have ever lived on the face of the earth have been used by God, but their background was somewhat shady. And the reason for that was that people go through hardships in their natural life, and then they find spiritual life through God, either in the Old Testament or in the New Testament. Now, of course, we call that being born again. But in the Old Testament, it was one who was chosen by God to do a task. And Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, all, all of them, you should go down to the patriarchs, all of them had problems. Jacob was an intense liar. He lied about everything. His name means deceiver. So everything he did was wrong. And that was a, a pass down from his history and the whole family. Abraham had some problems too, believe it or not. David, king of Israel, look at him. I mean, lots of stuff that we would point people today and say, oh, you, 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 you did this and you did that. and you." Say, but, but when God looks at a person, he looks upon the heart. And when that heart is repentant, and comes to God for help, God says, I will help you. He never turns an ear away from those who pray to him. You've got to remember that, children of God. Too many people think they're going to find their own way. Satan's smarter than you. I wish I could say he was not, but he is. He's smarter than you in the natural, but he's not smarter than you in the spirit. And unfortunately, a lot of Christians believe themselves more spiritual than they actually are. See? Do you hear what I just said? They love, the, they love the idea of being a spirit-filled believer. But when it comes down to the practicality of life, they fall flat on their face. You can't be a successful minister of the gospel until it's been ministered to you. Hear what I'm saying? And for people to run from a voice that is clear is to disrespect and dishonor God's way of doing things. God uses people. I told you that last week. You can't get around the fact that God wants to use you, every one of you, everyone watching over there on the internet. He wants to use you. But most people will say, well, I'll just send in a check. Well, a check is very helpful, especially this time of the month. But I will tell you that rather a check, God would rather, would rather you write a, a check from your heart and do whatever you do from the heart. And when you make a mistake, be quick to admit it and repent of it. And God is just and faithful to forgive it. So you see... The, the idea of being a Christian goes far much further than simply attending a building or going through the rituals of, of, of what we say Christianity is, is. And truthfully, the message of the cross has been dealt some severe blows since Jesus Christ was crucified on that cross. And ever since then, Satan has targeted two groups of people, God's people, Israel, and the new functional Gentile believer, born-again saints, he targets them too. And you can't live a passive life as a Christian. God doesn't mind you taking a vacation a little bit now and again and sitting on a beach and reading a book or having something nice to eat or whatever, go out with some friends, all that. That's fine. But when it comes down to you and God, you're the only one that can increase your spirituality. Amen. Amen. In order to do that, you've got to go somewhere where you hear the truth. And if you run from the truth, God help you. God help you. There's no, there's, no, there's no further place you can go. God has his ways of putting you in the pathway of people that can teach you and, and train you, train you. It's really important because if you get confused at what's training and what's just criticism, you're in trouble too. I had a couple of years in, in the army in Australia, you know, that train you as you come out of college and 
the, the, anyway, it's a long story. But the, 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 the gunnery sergeant who was training us, the platoon I, I had to be in, he was a hard, very hard person. And uh, when he finished teaching you, you, you hurt. I mean, I would stand in a very sloppy manner and he'd drop the, the old Enfield 303, he'd drop that right on the top of my foot and it hurt really bad. I thought he'd broken it. And I hobbled off the field. He said, go and sit down for a while and think to yourself, why did I do that? And I realized I did it because I was not following his instruction and I was being rebellious. And I paid a price for it. What well, makes you think God's any different? It doesn't, it's not that he withdraws from you. It's just that he withholds from you. you know, Father, in the name of Jesus, let your spirit be upon this group of people today. So don't stand up. You might fall over. Listen, let me tell you how we get from God. Is this thing going to follow me if I move a little bit? Well, will anyway. If you want from God, like you guys are faithful here all the time, all the time, all the time. That's a wonderful thing. If you want God to speak to your heart today, don't look to me to dig into your delvy little heart and figure out what's on and what's not. The first thing you ever do is, God, I'm here. You're here. What you have for me, I don't want to leave without it. That's demonstrated by enthusiasm. Enthusiasm. Not sitting back and saying, what's the preacher going to give me today? Are you listening to me? So when you get an opportunity to say, here am I, Lord, it's like he already knows that, doesn't he? Yes. Then why should I ever now and again stand if the preacher has a prayer he wants to pray? Why should I stand? It's respect to the presence of God and respect for the preacher. I don't care whether you love me or not, but you better. You won't go to heaven. If you have a desire to grow in the things of God, don't ever disrespect those that God has sent you and have proven themselves to you as sent by God. Don't disrespect that because God will not send you better if you haven't learned to accept what he's given you as the best. Amen. See what I'm just saying? Hear what I just said? If you treat the people, the people that God sent into your life to train you, treat them as the best and then God will give you even better. And if it's not better, he'll give you more. And the church as a whole in the United States and worldwide, I might add, has walked away and turned their back on God. It doesn't happen overnight. We talked about that ad infinitum ad nauseum. But the reason people turn away is they have found a substitute which suits them better. Hmm? There's a reason why you're here all the time. I see that. God sees that. They're out the front with their signs for, you know day of life, uh, celebrating life. And a lot of you are very, very faithful, but some of you have not been faithful. And what am I supposed to do about that? I can't come around and knock on the door of your door and bang you on the head and say, wakey, wakey, because then you'll just feel like, oh, he's critical or he's judgmental. No, I care about you. If I didn't care about you, I would have gone a long time ago and be sitting under a coconut tree somewhere. Amen. There's no coconut trees in Florida that I know about. Let's go further down. So don't not, not talk about that. So when I give you an opportunity to just agree with the man of God in prayer, you may not like me, but at least honor God and acknowledge the fact that he sent me to you. Yes. Would you do that for me? Yes. Then let's try again. Yeah. You too. Stand up. Yes, you're not exempt. Father, behold your people. Behold those, Father, that are going through trials, difficulties, tribulation. And I know, Father, that you're smiling today because as they gather together, you have a plan for them. You desire them above all things to pursue that plan, that the promises of God may come to pass in their life. These men and women, Father God, have made the decision today to be in your house. My prayer is that, Father, you'll cause my tongue to be as the pen of a ready writer. And that the words that I speak, Father, will not just be my words out of my mind, but your words spoken out of my mouth. And if I speak your word out of my mouth, it has the same power that it did when Jesus spoke the word of God. So I proclaim a blessing over these men and women. I know they're being challenged. They're being challenged because of their stand, not in spite of it. These men and women, Father, in their own place in the kingdom are champions. So today, Father God, I pray that you'll quicken them, sharpen their spiritual equipment, make their minds sharp to remember, and help them above all things, Father, to respect you, and that everything that we say, everything that we do today, will glorify God Almighty, the creator of the heavens and the earth, and Jesus Christ, his son, who gave us salvation, 
and the power of the Holy Ghost, hallelujah, the Holy Ghost who is here to quicken us and show us things to pass, things that are surely coming to pass. In Jesus' name, and all the saints of God said, Amen. There you go. Now you can be seated. Thank you. Most preachers out there will understand what I just said. I just saw some film the other day. I was Actually, my wife, when I got up this morning, she was watching Charles Capps. He actually came to this platform yes, once. And uh, I think the first thing he said out of his mouth was, you've got to watch your mouth, son. I said, well, yeah. Because he was really big on speaking a word. You can have whatsoever things you say. And I said something like, oh, it's been a bit of a tough week. Well, you can have whatever you say. That's a stupid thing to say. I said, thank you, sir. You're right. <laughs> You're exactly right. And I loved him because he was a straight shooter. He was a farmer. And it's like he never put up with, he never spent much time with anybody that didn't have a heart for God. Because what's the point? If they want to know something about God, then you should have a, a quick and ready mind to share the, the truth that's in you. Always be willing to give a, an account of the hope that is in you. But if you spend most of your time with idiots, then you'll become an idiot. I hate to tell you that, but it's true. You know, young people today are having a great deal of difficulty because they're being guided oftentimes by people who have no clue. You may have a Christian mom and dad, and if you do, then that's a blessing. But if they're not able to get through to you because of all the negative things that you're hearing from your school friends, your girlfriends, your boyfriends, whoever else you hang around, then you will start to be exactly what you say. You will, I said, well, I, I, I'm not happy with my face. Why not? It's the face God gave you. But I don't look as pretty as her or as handsome as him. Uh, I'm not as smart as so. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. God made you unique. When you stop trying to fashion yourself after pagans, then you can start to blossom. Once I want, actually, in my family, I had a, you know, some relatives and nephews, nieces and stuff. One of those nieces had some severe issues with uh, birthmarks, you know, on the face. And uh, she was always trying to cover it up. She, every time she went somewhere, she always just, she'd let you see this side of the face and not that. There was nothing else wrong. I mean, she's a regular, normal, beautiful girl, but had this big old birthmark. And then I hadn't seen her for years. And then one day her mum brought her over to the house. And I, and I didn't recognize her because she was a stunner. I mean, an absolute stunner. These big brown eyes and a skin did. What happened? Well, over the period of time, that birthmark faded away. And a lot of that was because mom and dad were praying. Her sisters were praying for her because they wanted her to win. But to a woman, her face is important. Am I right? Spend enough time pampering it, right? So, so, so the point I'm trying to make is prayer over a period of time and people saying that she's beautiful. And when I said to her, you're a stunner, she said, do you remember me? I said, I remember you, but not as a stunner like you are now. Remember the uh, birthmark on your face? She said, God took care of that. God took care of that. So please remember the, imp the importa importa impartation and the import of what other people say to you, around you, behind your back, let none of those things su suffer themselves to become imaginations in your mind so that you can start emulating other people. Try to be comfortable with who you are in your own skin and let God deal with the rest. And you'll find that after a while, we'll talk about this distinctly in a second. I'm sorry it takes so long to get here. Welcome. Come on in. So of all the times and all the people that you see and all the ones that you spend time with during the week, they are, in one effect or another, one degree or another, changing your outlook. Watch what you see, the eye gate, the ear gate. But you see what's going on in the TV series? I have, like Fox News, just pulled some things from people to support from people. They become very slanted, very leftish, wokeish, if you like. And people often say to me, well, do you watch the news? I say, I watch them all, BBC. You know. But when I hit something that's really off, I just turn it off. We're very limited on what news we can get anymore. I sometimes pedal into the European broadcast because they say things that we don't ever hear over here. And I'm watching what's going on right now with Netanyahu and Israel and how he's being harassed by leaders, even the person that's sitting in the White House. I won't call him my president because he's not. But he's sitting in the White House telling Netanyahu how to run his business. And I thought to myself, there's a real general. He basically told, in a very nice way, 
told uh, the president to butt out. Mind your own business. Israel is my business, not your business. Is Israel going to win? Yes, they will. But it's going to be drawn out because of the opposition. And the, and the, and the talk. And the, and the, can you imagine the negativity that that man has to go through? Even Donald Trump. Look, all those suits. What's behind all this? Well, we could say evil, and it would be, correct? But you've got to remember this as your, as your overseer. Let me tell you this. Remember that everything that's negative that happens, everything that tries to take from you something that's important, is spiritually led and spiritually guided. The evil that's overwhelming the world right now is a spirit of anti-Christ. Now, the word anti doesn't mean against Christ because he knows he can't directly come against Christ. What he does is he provides substitutes. That's why a lot of people around the globe have walked out of the church. Because if you think that virus is that killer dealer that it's supposed to be, it's not. There was over 300,000 unexplained deaths in the United States last year that had nothing to do with COVID. Some of those were drug-related. We talked about that last week a little bit. But all the evil that comes in across the borders, from the atmosphere, everywhere around you, from the people that you know that are pagans, it's all a spiritually assigned uh, uh, doctrine developed by the enemy, knowing your, 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 your likes and your dislikes. Satan knows your soul man better than you do. He knows he cannot conquer your spirit man, but he can certainly persuade your soul man. When your soul man gets to the point where it begins to quit, give up, or walk away, or he convinced of a lie, like... The whole, the whole COVID thing had a modicum of truth, but that it was a killer is not true, unless you're old and infirm and sick. They'll tell you that, unless you have a uh, morbid condition state physically, uh, old or infirm in some reason, or your, your immune system is shot. Most people got over it pretty quickly. I've probably, I've, I've probably had that three or four times. So I cough a little bit, sweat a little bit, drink some lemon juice, and have some zinc, and away it goes. But a lot of people believe it. And because like the other day I went out, someone's got this huge mask on their face, looked like a big old octopus thing sitting there. And I didn't say anything because it's their right to do what they want to do. But I'm not going to live in bondage to anything. I, being, I, I don't see the point. I said, you know, we have to take uh, 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 care to make sure that we don't misappropriate common sense ethics of hygiene, just washing your hands all the time. If you're sitting next to someone who's coughing their lungs out, move. Excuse me, and just move. If you're on an airplane, someone person next to you, <coughs> move. So you say, seriously, uh, not so happy with this seat here. Because it's up to you to take care of what goes into your body through the air and everything else. You'll get over it. I've had people who oh, I feel very sick. I said, well, stop saying you feel very sick. Let me pray for you. Now, when I pray for you, don't ever mention this sickness again. Thank God for healing you of that. Thank God for blessing you with strong, healthy lungs. Amen? Yes. And that might sound too simplistic for you, but this is the way that faith is not a difficult thing to grasp as long as you believe there is such a thing as faith and then demonstrate it in your life. Yes. Say amen? Yes. Ooh All right. I don't know if I was in the middle of talking about something else, but anyway, that's where I went with that. All right, so. Uh, where to start? Where to start? Six stages of the Christian life. Now, this may come as a little surprise to you, but I don't think I've ever heard this taught anywhere. And the reason it just came to me is because God spoke that to me. He, he gives me one-liners. And he started talking to me a couple of weeks ago, three weeks ago, about the six stages of Christianity. And then he started to add to those as I went along and came up with six. And I'll tell you what the six are because we're not going to get them all done today. But I will give you the six stages of it. The first cycle, I call them cycles, not stages, but cycles. The first cycle in Christian life, emulates exactly what Jesus had to experience as he grew as the Son of God. Remember, the Bible says, What is man that thou art mindful of him? That you have created him a little lower than the angels. Now, I'm looking around here too, and I want to, some of these young girls in here, I want you to tell you, be very, very careful who you connect yourself to in the way of a boy or a man. Are you listening to me? If you pick somebody basis of how they look or whether they've got a J-O-B or something, you're setting yourself up to be pulled down. Would you rather be a God-fearing young woman and have the knowledge that God is for you and not against you or date some idiot that doesn't know his left hand from his right? Wait for a while. Be patient. Don't comp I don't, this keeps coming to me. Comparing yourselves to other people. 
Don't do it anymore. You, you know, as a Christian girl, you have certain standards that you should hold up before yourself and everybody else. The greatest word in the English language, believe me, I know as a man, they'll, they'll come up with all kinds of reasons why you should do what you prefer they didn't do. They're all sneaking and sniffing around like little dogs. The best word in the English language for you is no. Pretty simple. God gives you the power to do it because you're not driven by that. Most women do that because they want the attention of somebody else that they rather find attractive. And you give away an awful price. An awful price. After a happy little note. First cycle is birth. Now, every one of these will reflect exactly. Now, listen carefully. Each one of these stages or cycles exactly reflects the same life seasons that Jesus lived. In other words, he is a walking, talking. He is because he's alive and sitting on the right hand of the Father. He is a walking, talking example by what he did on this earth for every Christian who follows after him. You often heard Jesus say, if you, if you believe this, then follow me. Believe you, I'm able to do this. And they dropped their nets and followed him. What does that mean? They were saying, Jesus, I know that you've got something that will give me not just eternal life, but something that will make my life worthwhile living. So when Jesus said, drop the nets and I'll make you a fisher of men, that involved teaching, training, and reforming. These were, Peter was, most of those men, with the exception of one or two, had full-time work that they were skilled for. Peter just happened to be a fisherman. Now, I know a lot of fishermen that do it commercially, and they are as strong as bulls. They've got hands that will break your hand in half a second flat because they work with their hands all day pulling in rope. And, and, you know, they're just strong men, hard men. And especially when you go to sea for weeks at a time, the sea has a way of making you hard. Uh, it's a hard life. And I can imagine Peter didn't accept instruction very well at all and then got closer to the, his, one of the stages you'll be able to pick out where he was. He comes to a stage in his life where he says, I'll never leave you, I'll never leave you, Jesus. I'll never leave you, I'll always love you, I'll always follow you. And Jesus said, no, you won't. And then, of course, he said about the cock crowing three times and blah, blah, blah. And when Peter heard, those, heard the cock crow, he remembered the master's words. There's something about the word of God when you speak it to people that will stick with them if they really want to learn. Now, I can't imagine the thousands of people that have been through this house over the years. And then when you least expect it, they turn their back and walk away. How is that possible? Well, of course, I just said to you, they find a substitute. Either the substitute person or you, they find something in you that they don't like or whatever it may be. They don't like you preaching the, the unadulterated book. Now, I've never done that from a perspective of I'm perfect and you're not. When I talk about respecting the ministry, I'm talking about respecting those that God has sent your way. I don't know what kind of father you had. You might have had a mean one, but fathers are supposed to be respected and mothers are supposed to be respected. And you might have had the worst father in the world, or abusive father, a neglectful mother. They're still your mother and your father. So you can, you can still respect them without causing yourself to follow their example. Amen? I'm glad you're here today. All right. So each one of these life lessons or cycles will directly connect to the life that the master lived. May the Lord anoint me today for this. Look at this. First cycle. The first cycle is birth. Every man, everyone. Listen to this very carefully. The only way a human being can interact on this planet is if they are birthed naturally. Satan cannot invoke spiritual forces against a human being unless he has access to that human being. We're going to discover that as a person is born again, you become a different being altogether. Most of you don't recognize yourselves as spiritual beings, but you should start to think that way. And then when, as, when the Spirit of God in you, and we'll get to that in a second, when the Spirit of God gets in you and gets around people who are not spiritually inclined, you'll know. If you're truly born again and you can hang around pagans, heathens, and people who have an antichrist spirit in them and, don't, and doesn't affect you, then something wrong. 
You need to find a closet somewhere and say, Lord, what happened? There's a burning fire in me. It doesn't, doesn't burn anymore. Or who have you been hanging around? Who have you been listening to? Who have you been trying to copy or emulate? So these stages are important. The first cycle, birth. Jesus Christ, Matthew 1.18, says he was a child brought forth by the Holy Ghost. Now, if God is going to use a man on the earth, he has to use a natural man or a natural woman that had been birthed into the earth because that's legal. Now, listen carefully. That's why when people get into hybrids and, and creating test tube babies, and a while back they made a sheep, remember? Molly the sheep, or they named sheep for it. They cloned that sheep outside of the, outside of the ewes' uh, womb, I guess you call it, and uh, lived for a while and then died. The only way a human being can be successful and used by God is if they're born into this world naturally. You hear me? Therefore, we know that he's created in the image of God. Therefore, every child, every child that is born has within that child the potential to become a child of God. But we know that not everybody that's born becomes a child of God. That's why so many of us in here have made a stance against abortion. You may be killing the next president of the United States. You may be killing a king or a queen. You may be killing someone who does a great deal of good for people on the earth. You may be, putting, you may be killing a, a soul that has a future of being very productive and helpful. Maybe a nurse or a doctor. I was going to say lawyer, but not so sure about them. All of those, that's what I like. <laughs> All of those people are legal on the earth because they have a natural body. Now, do you remember in the Garden of Eden? Because you know the story over and over again. Satan then preserved himself or presented himself as a, as a serpent. Now, you say he was upright then. What's the deal with that? Well, back then, the serpents apparently had, they walked upright. And part of his curse was that he was lowered to the ground, lost the ability to walk around, and now had to crawl on his belly in the dust. But if you remember, when he came into that garden, he came in as a created being, not as a human being. You've got to think about what I tell you. A lot of you are being affected by people in your houses and in your workplace and where you go and fellowship, well, not fellowship, but where you go and have fun or go for dinner, you know, people that you know. A lot of them have spiritual forces working in antagonism to your faith. You, you've got to choose the people you hang out. I keep saying that, don't I, because it's important. Anything that's negative that comes into your life has a spiritual base to it. Remember, God is only good. He thinks well. He does well. He creates things that are purposeful and useful. But Satan's desire is to destroy that. Now, in the garden, as a serpent when he came in, he was illegal. In the, in, to the point was, he was illegal that he was unable to change the spiritual nature that God had placed in Adam and then in Eve. He couldn't do it. Well, how did he do it? He appealed to the carnal nature of Eve, knowing that the authority was first given to Adam. Are you listening? That's why it's important the men you have in your life. You don't want to be married to somebody who's a borderline heathen. So when he came in and he started to talk to Eve to try to convince her to break the law that God had put in her heart, he was doing that in a way which was totally illegal. Had Adam or Eve risen up and said, Satan, get behind me, as Jesus did in the garden, then he would have had to leave. But she invited him in. She invited him by letting, her, letting him share with her spiritual laws that would evoke a lack of truth in the way she responded to him. We call it compromise now. So the legality of people on the earth, for example... Demons have to have a body, but they can't enter into a human being except by ignorance of the human being and by willingly acknowledging him. That's why when Jesus cast the devil, they said, send us, send us into the pigs. They have to have a human body, excuse me, they have to have a body in order to initiate spiritual change on the earth. So everyone in there who's been born of a woman, I presume that's everybody. <laughs> if you're born of a woman, then you have a spiritual right to take authority in this earth. If you're born again. Now listen to this. So it says here in the first cycle of Christianity, if he was born of the Holy Ghost, the reality of spiritual rebirth and natural birth. Now listen to these scriptures because they're important. 
In John 3, 5, he says, Verily, verily, Jesus said unto them, Except a man be, water, be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Now, basically, that's what I'm telling you. Nobody can enter into the spiritual realm and receive a spiritual rebirth unless they are, first of all, been born naturally into this earth. Born of water. You ladies have had a baby, you know that water's attached to that, right? When that water breaks, you know, that's the beginning of the baby coming. So, well, I presume, I don't know, I'm not a woman, but that's what they tell me. So, if the water is symbolic of the natural, Jesus said, Jesus said, unless he's born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom. There's no entrance for you. Every human being that's born, will, if they die without recognizing Jesus Christ and accepting him into their heart, they die spiritually dead. Even though you have life, which is spiritual, that life has to be handed over to the one who gave it in order to sanctify it. Now, people, people think about being born again as a simple little procedure. It's certainly not. After you're born again, we'll talk a few more about then we'll move into stage two. After you're born again, that's when the work begins. What work? The work of letting go and letting God. There's a lot of people never get beyond this stage. Stage one, oh yeah, uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm, so, I'm saved, I, I, I'm born again. I, when I was a little girl, I went down there and they, they sprinkled water on my head and told me that I was beautiful and lovely. And So what? So what? Jesus reached the age of accountability very early. I'm sorry this mic's popping a little bit. It's a little bit hot. But Jesus reached that stage very early. When he was 12 years old, he was answering spiritual questions. Now, that didn't come to him supernaturally. He was studying the Torah. He was studying the Bible, studying the books, finding out what, what they're all about, the law of Moses. But for a lot of people today, we, see, well, that's why they want to take Christianity and teaching the Word of God out of the schools. Because then they turn every new child into a prodigy of a socialist or a Marxist socialist or a communist. That's how they do it. They rob you of your ability to be able to know what the Word of God says so that your guidelines will come from the government, not from God. Jesus didn't want any confusion with this. He said, he said to Herod, you'd have no authority at all if my father hadn't given it to you. you he didn't say you he could have judged him very quickly. He could have said anything. But Jesus said, don't you realize that my father gave you the authority you have now? Did he give it to you for good or did he give it to you evil? And then Herod says, well, who are you? Who do men say that I am? said that to Peter. Herod knew. He knew there was something going on here that was supernatural. He washed his hands. And now I'm going to get to this point too because a lot of people have asked me, what's going on over there in Israel? There's a, there is a, I'm going to pause a little break here if you're doing editing this because I'm going to talk a little about the Holocaust. There was a program on last night on TCM, I think it was, about the Holocaust, part one and part two. And there's, there's a reason why so many channels, and I forget his name now, but the host is a Jew himself. His father was a very well-known Jew uh, in the motion picture business. Horowitz, I think, Horowitz, anyway. I sat there and after 15 minutes I was crying. How in the world did God allow this to happen? And I think I may have answered it. Would you be interested in what a biblical answer to be with that? Yeah. People, people want to know. My, my neighbors are all Jewish, but one of them in particular was interested in, and his wife turned him off of it. But these are some scriptures that I wrote down earlier and to me is rather important. Regarding Yeshua and his people, Israel. One of the shortest verses in the entire Bible when it comes to Jesus' reference to his Jews is in John 11.35. It's a very short little passage of Scripture. And there it says, Jesus said, or rather, Jesus wept. Jesus wept. When he saw how the people that he came to rescue and redeem, for the most part, were swayed very heavily by the religious leaders, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, he looked at them and listened to how they were talking back to him regarding what Jesus was trying to teach him, and he cried. He wept because, if you like, when his friend Lazarus died, it says that he loved his fellow Jewish people. Jesus wept when he saw Lazarus had died. He cried. That's when he did it. And then we think, why did he cry? Because he was attached to him. He loved him. And this is not the only time that Jesus interceded or wept for the nation of Israel. 
in Luke 9.41, it says, When Jesus approached Jerusalem, he saw the city and he wept over it. Why? Because in a very short period of time, the Romans were going to destroy the whole city, flatten it. And he knew that multiple hundreds, if not thousands of people, were going to be butchered. Romans didn't come in there and take Cape captives. He killed them. They killed them. Put a sword in them. Male, female, didn't make any difference. Kill them all. And Jesus wept not because he didn't care. He wept because he did care. Then why in the world didn't he come to aid and to rescue the people in the Holocaust? And the answer to that, for all intents and purposes, is not as difficult as it may seem. The Messiah, as we recognize him, is still being waited on by the majority of Jews. They're still waiting for the Messiah to come. Now, I would share with you that according to the New Testament, one day Jesus will return as King of Israel. And the Bible says that he will destroy the enemies of the Jewish people and judge those who have tried to destroy the Jewish people throughout the centuries. Revelation 19, 15 if you want to write it down, Revelation 19, 15 and Zechariah 14, 1 through 5. But what about now? The problem we have is that the, the communication and the, and the covenant which was available to the Jews first and then to the Gentiles came under the heading of Jesus Christ, the way, the truth and the life and that nobody comes to the Father except by and through me. And as an act of will, I want, I want you to remember something. If I scribble this down, I don't know if I did or not. But there was an opportunity that Jesus had to share much more truth than was willing to be received. And the reality is if people refuse the Redeemer... Then they, receive, then they refuse the covenant. And if they refuse the covenant, then God is unable to bring them the help that they need. Why? Because it would be illegal for God to do that. Now, what do you mean by it's illegal? Every man, woman, boy, and girl has a will. And God created you in his image. So if you want to go out and sin tomorrow morning and sin in five minutes and run down the street and shoot some God forbid, you could do that if you wanted to. There are consequences, yes, maybe not anymore with the law the way it is. But generally speaking, the ability of men and women to follow after and receive the benefits of the cross come through the cross, not in spite of it. Now, if you read the scriptures, you'll find there's going to be a great revival before the Lord returns amongst Israel, Jewish people. And I believe there are multitudes of ministries that are in Israel right now and around the world that are ministering the gospel regarding Yeshua HaMashiach to get as many Jews as they can to convert and to recognize, bingo, the Messiah came 2,000 years ago. You're waiting for a Messiah that's not going to come. Now, of other faiths, of which we are aware, including the Muslim faith, they believe that the Antichrist, when he comes, he'll be the Messiah. That's the one they're looking for. Everybody's looking in the wrong direction at the wrong people. I don't doubt for one split second that there were people there in those horror camps that cried their eyes out and watched what was happening to their children and their wives and their husbands. And perhaps some of them heard in their own heart, yield over and give your heart to Jesus as Messiah. There's no guarantee that because of that they would have rescued two or ten or five hundred. But the fact that they died has, no, has nothing to do in particular with the fact that God doesn't care about him. He loves them. But you and I are all given the right to make our own choices. And if we don't repent, they ask the disciples the same question. What should we do? Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and your sins shall be forgiven. Receive ye the gift of the Holy Ghost. So anyway, born again. We'll get back to that right now. The reality of the spiritual rebirth. We cannot be born again naturally, only by the Spirit of God. People who go through religious experiences have not been born again. The majority of them go through a little ritual prayer and somebody waving incense over the top of your head and declaring now that you're sinned, you know, do you you accept accept, uh, Jesus uh, as your savior? Uh, uh, Oh, sure. But they don't know what they're doing, why they're doing it. 
knowing why they're being sprinkled instead of baptized. They have no clue, no clue at all. And so to allow somebody to get to the point where they don't know the difference between right and wrong and ask them to receive God as your Savior without knowing who He is, is pointless. You say, well, I already know all that. Well, listen carefully because you'll learn some sums you don't know. This whole experience, Jesus said in John 3, 3, except a man, this is interesting, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, in, in, in John 3, 5, it says, a man, and except a man be born of water, the natural birth, and the spiritual rebirth, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. And two verses earlier, he says, except a man be born again, here's another caveat, he or she cannot see the kingdom of God. What does that mean? Well, when, we're, when, we're, when we leave our body and our spirit leaves our body, we go to see the kingdom of God. We'll see the kingdom. Now, that's what he's talking about. There is literally a great deal of difference between the ability to discern your spiritual surroundings. Now, listen very, very carefully, my brothers and sisters. A person who is not born again will have very little clue as to the spiritual makeup of the surroundings in which they are currently in. I'll say it again another way for you so you'll understand it. If I or anybody that's got to walk with God and the Spirit of God dwells in them goes into a place where there's evil or where there's wickedness or where there's lying and stealing and cheating and all, all manner of evil going on, you'll know it. The Spirit of God in you, know, just when I walk into a place sometimes and they, people start speaking horrible things over me. They don't know who I am. Sometimes you get on a phone with somebody and you'll talk to them a little bit and they'll say, God bless you and say, why did you say that? Very few people have ever said that to me, but those people are devils. <laughs> they don't like you. They don't know why they don't like you. They just don't like you. And so as a born-again Christian, let's flip it. Let's say you go to a school or a college or a workplace where the people don't like you because you're a Christian. Be aware of it. You may not be able to leave the job, but be aware of it and conduct yourself accordingly. You can't make friends of these people. See? And the same reason I said, don't marry an unbeliever. Don't be unequally yoked. Why is there a reason for that? Because spiritually you are incompatible. In, when I got married, I, I, was, I was backslid. I, I wasn't even backslid. I wasn't even born again. My wife was a backslid Baptist. But she finished up taking me to church, trying to convert this old heathen boy. I guess it worked in the long run. But of all the things that I went through up to that point, I laugh when people talk about Christianity. You know why? I had no discernment. I got around people who are evil, and they, to me, they're just like fun people. You know, eat, drink, be merry, get drunk, stoned, whatever you want. I had no clue, no conviction in my heart that these people were not good people. I had no conviction when it came to doing business. If I was doing business and I was a crook, it didn't matter to me. If I was smarter than you and take your money, so be it. But something happened after I got born again. I started to see the kingdom. I'll read what I wrote down here. We begin to see differently, think differently. And the revealing of spiritual life comes in all around you. When you start getting around people that are not, you go to a place. I was invited by a friend of mine in Fresno to go to the Catholic Church. Now, I'm not against my Catholic brothers and sisters. If they're born again, spirit-filled, praise the Lord. I'd rather they're Catholic because they already fear God. But after that, they can move on to bigger revelations of who Jesus really was. And not just the son of, not just Mary. But I went to this, she kept inviting me. Why don't you come? Why don't you come to a service? I said, oh, yeah. yeah. All right. So I went with her. And the, when I went in there, I sat in, almost in the back pew. And the lights dimmed. And then, I might have told you this before, there were two little lights came on in the eyes of Jesus hanging on the cross, two little red lights. And it scared the hell out of me. They had little piercing red light bulbs behind. And I thought, they're trying to give life to a statue trying to get people to somehow revere that that statue's alive. And I literally felt sick. And I'd only been saved a little bit, but I felt sick in the place. Why? Because I became spiritually aware. Now this is where 90% of Christians drop the ball. Hmm? You are, for the most intense and purposes, dull as a doorknob when it comes to what's around you. If people knew those that God had anointed and they responded correctly, you couldn't drag them out of that place or hack them out of that place with a barge pole or an axe because they're separated from where they were and now they're joined to something that gives them life. 
So how can people, well, we already discussed it, how can people walk away from that relationship? Because they never really had a deep relationship in the first place. They substitute their soul for their spirit. And I challenge anyone, including those that are watching on the internet, if you're truly born again, the Spirit of God has come into your heart. And you know that happens by asking. When the Spirit of the Lord comes into your heart, it's virtually impossible unless you allow yourself to backslide quickly when Jesus talked about the sowing of the seed. Finding a place where God has planted you and let yourself grow there spiritually, emotionally, financially, physically. All of that cut stuff working together and the spirit man having the preeminence in your life. I challenge you, you cannot walk away from the life in Christ and not feel the pain. All you can do is numb it and pretend it's not there. Or make up excuses. Oh, I didn't like his accent or... He's too, he's too wild and woolly. Uh, uh, I don't know. He's too harsh. He's too this. He's too that. He's critical. Da, da, da. And talk yourself out of the one place where you're going to grow and become stronger in the Lord. But it begins with the birth. The new birth. Now, for those people who were wondering, how do I know if I'm really born again? Well... This factor here of being able to discern things spiritually around you is very important. But also, we begin to see differently. And the revealing of the spiritual life as it comes in around you begins to change your life. Now, I've got to add a caveat to this. This doesn't necessarily mean that when you're born again, you become spiritually active and start being able to, you know, move in signs and wonders. It happens very rarely, but sometimes it does. But in general, it's not talking about the spectacular things that will start to happen. It's the very little subtle things. If I were to ask you, you don't have to put your hand up, but I have to ask you, the last time you were in a group of people and you know that group of people were not any way or form connected to your spiritual faith, didn't you all feel something? And what did you do with it? What did you do with that? Well, probably nothing. Why? Because I didn't want to offend anybody. Then you've already offended God. Do you see? That's the price of Christianity. So now, if the natural man does not want to be born again, being born again from a domain of which they know nothing, the natural man does not want to be born again because they are, don't see the necessity of changing the one who leads their life. The natural man considers natural things and has no discernment of spiritual things. That's why Jesus said you can't see the kingdom of God, you can't enter into the kingdom of God until you're truly born again from above. Got that? Okay. Now there may be people who are listening to say, well, I, I go to church. Is it doesn't mean a thing. Devil goes to church too. Well, what about, it's a nice church, there's nice people. Well, good, that's wonderful. But you need to go somewhere where you are spiritually aligned with the people who go there, not the ones who pretend Pretend people, pretend Christians are very hurtful. Drag you down. Am I helping anybody? Yeah. All right, second cycle. Got to move quick. Second cycle. I'll probably get to three. I don't know today. We'll see. The second cycle, we find in the word death. Now, you've heard Jesus Christ born again, the Spirit of blah, 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 obviously. The second thing that he came into, the second cycle of life, was that Jesus had to die. Now, everybody knows that. You understand how it came to pass and when it came to pass. But the death actually refers to self-will and a dependence on the world system, which dictates what they say is right and what they say is wrong. Hmm? When we all of a sudden are convinced that we have to believe what the world tells us about what is right and what is wrong and follow their instructions, you're already beginning to die spiritually. Jesus in Luke 22, uh, 42 says, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will be done, but thine. This is a constant struggle for every Christian. It's to begin to allow him or herself to go to the book when they want to discover what it is, that they should, how they should respond to a certain affair in life. Scriptures have the answer for you. And if you can't necessarily find the scripture, ask somebody who's trained in these things to be able to help you and educate you and give you the scripture so that you can look them up for yourself. But Jesus going through the, the major 
preemption of his resignation of death had that battle as well. Said he sweat tears of, of, of sweat of blood breaking capillaries. That's what they explained that to mean. Actually, blood broke into his sweat. But it was a struggle he was having about having to give up the life he had as a human being because God was requiring it. He knew why. But the doing of it's another thing altogether, isn't it? Matthew 27, 35. Now, very, I'll make this brief, but I want you to study these for yourself later. And we're heading up to somewhere because most people have already been through the first stage. You've been born again. Congratulations. And filled with the Holy Ghost, and you understand the ramifications of being filled with the Holy Ghost, the things that come along with that. But a lot of people get stuck right here in the second cycle. They've never grown up spiritually. Now, you won't get that in many churches because they, they want you to stay sitting in your seat there and putting a dollar a week into the offering bucket. But that might sound harsh, but it's the reality of it. What does it say on the front there? It says ministry training center. This is what we're trying to do is teach you and train you. 2735, did you put it up on the screen for me? It says, then they crucified him and divided his garments, including, oh, excuse me, casting lots or gambling over who would get what Jesus had on, which is primarily just the robe seamless robe that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet they divided my garments amongst them and my clothing did they cast lots next verse and sitting down they kept watch over him in that place psalm 22 18 22 18 refers to the same event it says there my they parted my garments amongst them and they cast lots upon my vesture Hundreds of years before the event took place. This was the breaking loose of his earthly mantle. And the Apostle Paul says in Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. Now, we hear the people preach on that forever, but most of them, I know for myself, that's one of the hardest things to learn how to do is to let go of what you want and let God do what he wants. Everybody struggles with that, don't you? Yeah. And Paul likens that process to a process of death. It's not death of the spirit, because once a person is born again, you can't kill that spirit. You can't kill a spirit anyway. A person's not born again, their spirit goes to it lives forever as well, but just not in heaven. That's what we believe as Christians. But Paul says something very interesting here. He said, I am no longer just me existing to do what I want to do, but I am crucified along with Christ. I, I have chosen to give up my life for the purposes of the cross the same way Jesus gave up his life for the purposes of salvation and redemption to mankind. He had to resign himself to that. That's what we're talking about here, this death cycle. He had to resign himself that if I'm going to fulfill the purposes and the plans of God in my life, I'm going to have to be willing to let go of the things that I consider to be true or let go of the things that would preserve me. I am crucified with Christ. The, the old Paul has got to die in order for the new Paul to be an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ, you see. Now you say, well, I'm not called to be in a ministry. Yes, you are. Every one of you is. Give an opportunity to give an account of the hope in you, whether it's at your workplace or where are you. You, you should let your light shine. And you'd be surprised how many people put a, as Jesus said, put a bucket or a basket over the top of the light. He said, if you're going to put a basket over the top of the light, you may as well not have any light at all. And the people that surround them, I keep saying this over and over again, they will tend to change the way you think. And if they change the way you think, they'll change the, way, the things that you do. Until eventually the things that pertain to God will be the last on your list. And you wonder why your life doesn't go the way you want it to go. Unless a man is willing to give that up, God can never replace it with what's his. Hmm? I don't care what you were taught before, I'm telling you the truth. That if you're not willing to give up what you consider to be your calling and your purpose and your mighty, mighty ministry, you'll never have a ministry. At least not one that's endorsed by God. 
Nobody in their right mind wants to preach a message that runs people off unless that message is what God has told you to share with them in love. Not designed to judge, but in love so that you can grow. So this coming week, you won't be doing the same things next week as you did this week. Most of that starts with cutting off bad relationships. Not hanging around the same people that, that put you down or put your Lord down, whatever. Watch what you listen to. Watch what you watch. The natural man does not want to be born again. He will resist it with everything he's got. Habits, all these kinds of things that you find yourself being confronted with now. All of them have to be confronted, but you're not going to be confronting it with just your own strength and your own authority and your own power. You'll be confronting it with the word of the living God. And if I tell you the truth, that everything that has a negative connotation to it, everything has a spiritual root. Letting go of the past, letting go of parents, letting go of girlfriends, boyfriends. With the exception of just walking out of a marriage. It's a covenant, again. When covenants are involved, you need to be real careful with that. There are options, of course, but in generally speaking, that covenant of marriage is one that's supposed to be until death us do part. Not easy for a lot of people to accept that. That was the first thing that made me wonder about a brother that was really kind to me and the Lord. He'd been married four times. He was getting ready to do it five times. And I thought to myself, you broke covenant four times before now what's going to be different about this one same thing see he was picking people he liked with attributes that he wanted instead of once even seeking God and letting God bring perhaps a woman that's not as pretty maybe she's flat chested not pretty and little short stubby legs but she loves God and she's a great cook <laughs> I tell this joke quite often you know that song why, why doesn't God make why aren't, why aren't women more like men? Trying to get a woman to think like a man, a man, it doesn't work. But one thing I've discovered, when God does put two together, he'll make sure that it works for you. It may not be a perfect fit, but it'll be close. Personally, I like a little bit of backwards and forwards, but that's just me. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless, not I live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life which I now live, the life which I now live, in the flesh. See, he says you can't not live in the flesh, you'd be dead. You need your body to keep yourself alive. The life that I live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I'm out of time right now, so I'm going to begin the third cycle next week. The third cycle is burial. When Jesus went through this burial period, went through life, death, and then burial. And how are we going to discover how burial is, affects the life of the average brother and sister who goes to church. And I think you're going to find this rather interesting as well. Now, of course, the burial here is lots of types of the burial of the old man, but it's typified by a command that you should be baptized. Uh, and we'll talk about that as well and the necessity of that. The fourth cycle is the renewal of spiritual life. Resurrection. Try not to go to sleep on me. <laughs> Resurrection. The renewal of spiritual life. For most people who have been in the ministry, like IGO ministry for a long time now, most of you are stuck in the second cycle. Some of you moved on to the third cycle. Very few have moved into the resurrection cycle. That's when your whole being revolves around being spiritually inclined. The fifth cycle is becoming united with God eternally. That's a cycle, believe it or not. A lot of people drop out after the renewal of spiritual life and they'll drop out at that point too, in which case they don't see the fifth cycle, which is ascension. And finally, the sixth cycle, which is the return to the earth to rule and reign with the God and with the ascended family of God. Did I teach you anything today? This is more along the lines of you both subjecting yourself to abject examination, looking yourself in the mirror. It's not intended at all to give you an opportunity to feel down on yourself or put yourself down or say, I'm going to quit. 
None of that. It's designed to get you the opportunity to, as I said, look in the mirror to see what manner of man you are. And at the same time, make some changes. You can move through these stages fairly quickly. Not as quickly as perhaps you'd like, but you can move through them fairly quickly. And uh, next week, we'll carry on and see if we can complete these steps for you. So that you'll be able to help others who are in the cycle that you've already gone through. One thing I can promise you in closing on this particular subject is that the Holy Ghost will not let you go through this cycle until you have completed what he wants you to learn in that cycle. There is no early graduation. There is no giving out trophies to you because you crossed the line. The one who runs the race is the one that gets the trophy. Amen? All right, now, let me say this to you. Before we take up the offering, it's important that you concern yourself a little bit with the times and seasons in which we live. Now, when we were having hundreds of people on a regular basis here, it shouldn't come as a surprise to you that we were able to meet our budget and do things like have guest speakers in, have a, a, a band in the back here backing us up, all kinds of extracurricular things because we had the finances to do them. Now, this is the end of the month, and this is when people hold their hand out. I don't want to come to you with a tin cup begging for help. Because at the end of the month, I have salaries to pay and bills to pay. That's what, that's what happens. But I've watched over the years and the struggle that I personally had when times were tough. Now, the summer says, there is one that gathers together the precious seed and presents it to God and returns joyfully because he has seen the harvest, the fruit that comes from sowing the seed. For a lot of people, that's a hard thing to do when money is tight. Money is tight now. I understand that. But there's a secondary side to this too that I want you to see. Under the Old Testament, and I want to read you three verses of Scripture just to remind yourself. Exodus, uh, Exodus 36, please. Verses 2 through 6. Exodus 36, verses 2 through 6. This is when Moses has been told by God to make sure that the temple is in good shape. Now, you know that we just had some major expenses in this house. And I'm looking around at a group of faithful people. For the most part, the ones that I can see here are doing the best that they can. Now I'm going to ask you to do the best that you can't do. Push yourself a little. Because we can make the difference up knowing that God will honor your giving today, especially because I've earmarked it as a special offering day so that we can pay the bills at the end of the month. Now you can ask my staff, but I'll tell you myself, I subsidize it about as good as well as I can. I put a, a lot of, my, of our own personal wealth into keeping this building alive. Now, you enjoy it, the air conditioning and all that, but it costs money to do so. Just our power bill is now over $4,300 a month. That's crazy. Y'all want to see this building remain? Yes. I'm, going to need, I'm going to need some supernatural help. And the response to that is that God is a helper of those that help him. And if I say to you, I believe with all my heart, and I'm going to do a special offering as well, if I believe that with all my heart that when somebody responds to a, a, a request of God's servant to help support the work of the ministry, it isn't to grandize me. It's to pay the bills that we are obligated to pay. Okay, just so that you know. Now, I know you have bills too. And it's, it's, it's not always easy to think to yourself, well, I'm already a giver, Pastor. So I know you are. But at the same time too, if your heart's in the right place, God may even make a way for you to increase your, your wealth before it comes to the time to give it. But in the meantime, the best way to do that is to sow a seed. And this scripture is what I wanted to read to you. Here Moses is asking the people of God to come in and support the work of rebuilding the temple. Listen to this, it's awesome. Moses calls Bezael and Ahalob, however you pronounce that, and every gifted artesian in whose heart the Lord had put wisdom and everyone whose heart was stirred to come and do the work. Now, this is interesting because here Moses said, the hearts of the people who didn't have a skill set were touched, but the ones God wanted were the ones who were skilled. Eh? Now, when he rebuilt that temple, the skill was in the woodwork and the, the carpentry and the gilding and the masons. All those who had a particular ability to do something which was over and above the normal because he wanted the temple to re reflect the glory of God. He wanted people who were skilled in what they did. That's what international and ministry training is. It's about giving people a skill set. 
not just to get your heads big, but to make your heart bigger and to get you to fall in love with the Lord. And hopefully a little bit for me along the way. Eh? It's important. Listen to this. And he says, And he received from Moses all the offering which the children of Israel had brought for the work of the service of making the sanctuary. That's what I wanted to do today. I want to make sure that this is not a place of, of, of disdain when it comes to paying our bills. And I always pay my bills. God's house always has to pay its bills. You say, well, why don't we borrow? I'm not borrowing money on this building. I want it to stay debt free. That's not an ego thing. It's just something to honor God. So, so they continued bringing to him free will offerings every morning. Every morning they came along and brought an offering for the work of the temple rebuilt. Next verse. Then all the craftsmen who were doing all the work of the sanctuary came, each from the work he was doing. They set time aside to come and bring the offering, and then they went back to work. <laughs> and they spoke to Moses saying, listen to this, saints. The people, he's talking about his elders and those that surrounded him. They said to Moses, the people bring much more than enough for the service of the work which the Lord has commanded us to do. The people are doing more than you asked for. What would, what would prompt people to do that? Well, you say they love God, but they also respected Moses. Had Moses never asked, he wouldn't have got. See what I'm saying? So there's no reason why you should think, oh, he's just asking. because he There's nothing that I need that I'm going to take from you. What I want you to do is help me maintain the ship. Maintain the ship. Doesn't just happen. Now, it's not you that's going to provide all of the needs. It's God using you to provide some of the needs and taking that seed and multiplying it. Press down, shake it together and running over. God can cause goodness and mercy to flow into your bank account as well as he can anywhere else. I'm a living proof of that. Many of you here are the same way. You lost your job. How am I going to do it? Well, you sowed over and above. I know some people here give $500 or $1,000. That was more than they could afford to do ordinarily. And Kimberly knows because she keeps the books. And we know those people that have been extraordinarily grateful to God. And we note that. We always send them a little thank you. But the true thanks comes from heaven. You've got to believe that. The true thanks comes from heaven. And this verse here, to me, is wonderful. The last verse, it says, So Moses gave a commandment, and they caused it to be proclaimed throughout the whole camp, saying, <laughs> I wish I could say this sometime, maybe I will. Let neither man nor woman do any more work for the offering of the sanctuary. And the people were restrained from giving. <laughs> Hallelujah. This was a difficult time for them, and it's a difficult time for you. I know. But if you're looking for a rainy day, if you want God to continue to bring his blessing in season on your life, be willing to hear what he's saying to you. And those of you who are watching over the internet, I keep saying this, but I don't know if we know or not. I don't ask Kimberly for these things. But I can tell you the majority of the people that watch this program and which Donna and her helpers and her family and others spend a lot of time in presenting to you and, and making sure that it's recorded for you, the majority of those folks don't ever support this ministry with anything. And, I, you know, to me, if you're being fed in a place, that's where you go and pay your bill, right? Isn't it? If I go to Walmart and I go shopping at Walmart and I give the money to, to Coles or some other department store, they're going to scream their head off. Say, you bought your goods here, but why are you paying the money to somebody else? And some people have got a misguided sense of... Bring the tithe into my house that there may be meat in my house and prove me in this, saith the Lord, that I'll not open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that is possible for you to contain. Why? Because it continues to go on and on and on and on and on. You're looking for a perfect bookkeeper? The Holy Ghost is a perfect bookkeeper. If I didn't believe that, I wouldn't be sitting there. And I can tell you when I broke the love of money in my life, and I started to truly trust in God. It didn't come until I gave most of it to the kingdom. It's amazing what happens when, that, when you start sowing to that level. There's nothing else to worry about. I was worried about what was going to happen to my retirement. I had $1,000 and $500 and whatever it might be. And I felt God speaking to my heart to sow it. 
Because that's not going to rescue me if things get really bad. But I can call on my heavenly bank account and draw a check on heaven. And you wait and see. Like David said, when I was young and now I'm old. But I've never yet seen God's seed begging for bread. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you for allowing me to share that with you. It's from an honest heart. You pray and God will show you that my heart's right with this thing. I'm not trying to do it for any other means. And uh, I guess I just have to close with this. I'm Robin Hancock, and I'm proud to be the overseer and senior pastor of this church. And regarding this subject on the six stages of your spiritual walk, that's about all I have to say today about that. Thank you. Thank you.